Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Uh, today's Clip Studio Paint webinar will be presented by Dave Gibbons, where he'll review his workflow. So we have a few housekeeping items to review before the start of the webinar. Uh, the webinar will be approximately one hour long. All attendees will be muted. There will be a Q&A session at the very end of the webinar, the last 15 minutes. Attendees can ask questions in the box right away. There is a question box. Uh, you can look for that in your GoToWebinar uh, system. Due to time constraints, not all questions will be answered. The webinar will be recorded. The recording will be shared on social media and will be sent via email to all registrants and attendees. Today's panelists are myself, Fahim Niaz from Graphicsly, Joanna Brower from Celsius, and obviously Dave Gibbons. For those of you who've never had an opportunity to work with Clip Studio Paint, uh, please make sure to check out our site at clipstudio.net forward slash en or at graphicsly.com. Basically, Clip Studio Paint is your all-in-one solution for stunning, ready-to-publish illustrations, comics, manga, and animations. And of course, Dave will be going through some of the features of Clip Studio Paint today as well. Finally, we wanted to let you uh, know that it took a, a few different groups to put together this webinar. So we wanted to thank all of our uh, sponsors, um, including Wacom, Celsius, Graphicsly. And uh, with that, we were going to pass the reins of the webinar over to Dave, um, where Dave will start uh, about how he got involved with Clip Studio and the history, his history with it. Hello, everybody. I presume you can hear me. It's a real pleasure to be here um, and to share some thoughts about Clip Studio Paint with you. Um, I'll start off by talking a little bit about my history. I was, I was amazed to find that I first started using Clip Studio Paint, which was then known as Manga Studio, back in 2006. I actually bought my first copy of the software in 2006, and I was absolutely blown away by what you could do with it. It was so much superior to the, the other digital um, approaches I'd use, namely uh, Photoshop or Painter or Illustrator, because it was a piece of software that had been you know, designed specifically for the job of drawing comics in, rather than being a kind of one size fits all giant piece of software that you could manage to do comics in. So I was a convert from the very first time um, I saw it. Um, and in 2008, um, I found myself at the San Diego Comic-Con, a place that I quite often find myself. And I noticed that um, Smith Micro, who were then the publishers in the USA of Manga Studio, um, had a booth there. So I went over and introduced myself. And of course, this was at the time that the Watchmen movie was coming out. So they knew exactly who I was. And uh, I told them how much I I love the software. And um, they they asked me if I would be prepared to you know do some demos. And I said, yes, I, I would, because I'm a huge enthusiast. And when I'm excited about something, I like to share that excitement with um, other people. And so uh, I did a few appearances with with them and did a couple of webinars. Um, and those webinars were done on much, much more basic equipment than we're using tonight. So I've got every hope that the uh, technicalities aren't going to let us down. So um, basically the form this is gonna take is that I'll show you the tools that I use to draw comics and illustrations in Clip Studio. And then I'm going to show you um, a few examples of, of work that I've done using the software. And then at the end of that, we should have time for some questions and answers. So first of all, the, the screen you can see is the, is the basic Clip Studio Paint screen. Um, I haven't got all the palettes open because I don't need to have all the 
palettes open, I find that this selection is, is what I usually need, which is a, a panel with the tools, or rather the different sub tools, uh, the color wheel, um, the toolbox, the layer palette, and I often have the layer property palette open at the bottom of that. And then the, the rest of the screen is, is clear to draw in. So, um, you know, I be, before Manga Studio and Clip Studio came along, I'd spent maybe 30 years drawing comics using traditional materials. And I found the most effective way to work in the software was to try and replicate the sort of a process that I used when I was using, as it were, real world um, materials. So although there are, there are countless tools and countless materials available in Clip Studio, um, I tend to use ones which are very, very close to the ones that I would use in the analog world. So on the, um, on the subtool palette just here, which I'm moving around so you can see it, I've got a number of different palettes that I've assembled or I've downloaded or that come with the software in the first place, all sorts of paints, inkers, pencils, miscellaneous, technical. Um, and at the bottom of that, I have made my own sets of palettes. So I have one that is rather imaginatively called Dave's Faves, which has got really all the tools in it that I would ever, ever want to use all the different pens and pencils and brushes. And as you can see, there are maybe 12 or 15 of them. So that stops me getting lost in choice. So the first thing you do when you're drawing a comic is to pencil the artwork out as a prelude to drawing it in ink. So what, what I have here are digital equivalents of my pencils. The first one is just called digital pencil. And you can see this is quite a nice, soft, sketchy pencil that you can get a nice variety of lines in, that you can build up an illustration quite quickly in. Um, it's got a, uh, a a variable opacity. So this means that you can get a darker line by pressing harder. It's just like really drawing with a nice, soft, real world pencil. pencil when, when I was drawing uh, comics manually um, I would tend to get a hard pencil like a 6h pencil and rough the forms out quite basically just to get a sense of proportion and just to get a sense of how they were going to fit and to get the gesture and just to essentially get a light underdrawing that I could base my more detailed drawing on this has got a very low opacity, and uh, it, it means that you're never going to build up to very, very dark lines unless you really try to. So that helps in keeping this particular bit of the drawing in the background. Once I've got everything penciled out to my satisfaction using this 6H pencil, I then come in with a slightly softer pencil, uh, an HB pencil, which is a medium kind of pencil. I think what Americans call a number three pencil. Um, um, obviously, I would spend a lot more time than I, I'm able to here doing the rough drawing. But once you've got that um, light underdrawing, you can then come in with a darker, sharper pencil. And using the underdrawing as a guide, you can do a more detailed, nuanced drawing along these lines. OK, uh, I'll perhaps make that a bit bigger. You maybe get a better idea of the texture. As you can see, once you put this darker pencil line down, you really don't see the lighter pencil underdrawing. Um, now, something you can do with uh, with Clip Studio, which is which is very useful, is to actually change the color of the lines on any layer. Now, there is a tradition in comics and in animation to draw using a blue pencil. The reason you draw using a blue pencil is, again, when you draw on top of it in a gray pencil or in ink, the blue lines really become more or less invisible. You achieve this very easily in Clip Studio by using the layer property palette. And you merely hit 
the color here, which will then turn all the lines that were gray into blue lines. So you've immediately got the kind of blue line effect. Um, tap it again and you come back to gray. It doesn't have to be blue if you want to do it in red or you want to do it in a brown color or a green color, you can do that. That's totally uh, customizable. Um, sometimes though, I might actually want to draw in a blue pencil. So my next pencil down is blue pencil. And again, this replicates the traditional way of drawing comics where you use a, a blue line just to block in general proportions, general planes, general features. And what you can then do is finish that using the uh, HB pencil, which again, knocks the blue into the background. Or as some people like to do, use a red pencil to further um, elaborate the drawing. Uh, this I always find rather a nice thing to do. It feels kind of playful. It feels that rather than being a very ancient comic book artist that in some ways I'm kind of a kid again and I'm just drawing with my Crayolas on, on the rough paper that my dad used to bring home from work. So this can give a nice informal feel. Um, but again, if you've got a preference for colors, you can use anything you like. So that's it for the pencils really. The, the, the next thing is to ink the pencil drawings in. So for that, I would normally add a layer um, and I might actually, on the layer that I've done the penciling on, I might just knock the opacity down so that the lines fade away a little bit and enable me to see what I'm going to ink in more clearly. Now, the pens that I have, again, are rather limited because they don't really need to be <laughs> complicated. Um, I've got a tech pen, which is essentially, uh, wrong layer, which is essentially um, a mechanical pencil, uh, um, a mechanical pen where you get a fixed line width. Again, you can vary the line width. This mimics using a micron pen or a rotaring pen. It's very useful for drawing mechanical items or for doing accurate hatching. The next pen down that, that I use is called a, uh, a hard pen. Um, this is very useful when you want to get a good sharp outline around something and you're not particularly worried about varying the line weights. Um, when I drew Watchmen, which uh, I know you've all heard of many, many years ago, my first, the first pen that I used when I came to ink drawings in was a hard pen because I found that this gave it a really crisp, uh, really um, sharp kind of feel. Um, so I've got a replica of that here. The next pen down is a G pen. Um, a G pen uh, is actually a Japanese pen, but it's very, very popular with uh, manga artists. Uh, it's a kind of reasonably flexible pen with a top nib that you can very quickly get nice swooping thick and thin lines. Um, one, one thing I, I would say that is a real joy about inking digitally is that number one, you never run out of ink. And number two, you never smudge the ink. I remember way back in the early days of using uh, Manga Studio, um, I was drawing as I am now on a, on a Wacom Cintiq tablet. And I'd just drawn a really large area of black with lots of ha um, hatching and feathering on it. And I pushed my arm across to reach something up at the top. And I leapt back in horror because I thought I'd smudged the ink. Of course, that would be, be impossible. But I think it was at that point that I realized that I was really beginning to get used to drawing digitally and that it now felt as, uh, as common and as everyday to me as drawing in the traditional way. Um, you can see Clip Studio is saving automatically here, which is, which is rather good. Um, I, don't, I don't really want to um, test fate but I, the other thing I would say about Clip Studio is it's very robust. I've had very, very few crashes in it, and I've done a lot of fairly complicated work on it. So that's one thing I really appreciate. And the autosave function is, is really useful as well. Um, just one 
I'm talking about um, inking, th there's a feature that I particularly like, which is the ability to uh, draw with transparent ink. In other words, to erase. So it means without having to select the eraser tool in the color palette here, you can just select transparent and you can then go over the black lines you've drawn and very accurately erase them. It, it uses exactly the same tool to erase with as you've been using to draw with. So again, it, it makes it very easy to get familiar with the feel of it and saves you having to swap tools back and forwards. You can also draw in white, but generally it works better to keep the layers transparent and only have black lines on them, as that's very helpful when you come to color later on. Okay, so moving further down the, the pens, this is a, a four set pen. This is named after the famous American uh, illustrator, Robert Fawcett, who had a really nice ink line. And this again is a thick to thin kind of pen that sort of emulates the kind of line that uh, Fawcett would do. Next down is a dry inker. Um, that gives quite a nice crisp feel. I'm just gonna get rid of these other ink lines. Um, it's got a slight roughness to it, um, which can give you um, a really rugged kind of look. If you're looking to do something that's a little more gritty than the usual superhero or funny animal stuff, to have a pen with a bit of grit in it um, actually feels, feels quite nice. Then we have um, an ink brush, which again is a very thick to thin, um, swooshy kind of, kind of brush which tends to put down a heavier line or at least the way i've got it set you can you can emulate a real brush and put down really quite heavy ink lines um one of the ways that i tend to work when i'm inking something is to draw the the main lines that the the important lines first using a brush so this is quite often the first tool that i come to and then having used the rather uh, heavier line you can then use uh, a G pen or something like that, and you can do some finer kind of hatching or put some finer drawing in around more detailed features. Um, and the final ink tool is the lasso feel or lasso feel, I think you say it in the States. And this is basically um, an amalgam of the selection tool and the fill tool. You draw around something and it fills it in so you can very quickly get an area of shadow like this um you have to remember where you draw with it um as you can see that's a really really quick way of getting heavy blacks in there if you're doing a drawing that relies on this sort of chiaroscuro, light and shade effect. Um, and and it, it also enables you to draw things that have got really sharp corners, which is sometimes, sometimes helpful. Um, finally, um, finally, there are the um, uh, painting tools, which I've got down at the bottom here. Uh, there's one here I've called paint, which is a variable opacity brush again you can very quickly get quite subtle gradations of tone and color with that and the final one is called painterly which is similar but is even softer which you can use large to really very quickly fill in backgrounds again using as many layers as you like so those are basically the tools that I use. Um, there, are, there are many, 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 many more, um, many more um, pens and special inkers. Um, there, there are ones that emulate, um, if I can just find them. Am I, am I looking for the right thing here? Um, oh, yes. Here, for instance, is... The ability to get foliage very quickly if you're drawing shadows of trees something like that um, a huge a huge number of them which once in a while 
you might like to use for a specific purpose, but you're probably not going to use every, every day. The ones I've shown you are the ones I use literally every day when I'm drawing. So they make a good basis to start with. OK, that's enough doodling around. Um, I will now go to some actual pages, which are drawn rather better. Um, the first one I'll go to um, is this page, which was drawn for the British Comic 2000 AD when they had their, maybe it was their 40th anniversary, and they got a lot of us older artists to contribute to the page. So I'll show you how I built this up in Clip Studio. The very first thing I did was to do some thumbnail drawings. And as you can see, I did the thumbnail drawings considerably smaller than the finished page. Really, it's just a question of doodling around, trying ideas out uh, until you come up with a design for the whole page that you that you really like the look of. And the, the wonderful thing about doing layouts, some roughs using Clip Studio is that you can scale things up, up and down. You can rotate them. You can uh, you can rearrange the the order in which they appear, but basically with this, once I've come up with a um, with a layout that I that I liked, I um, I blew it up to um, I blew it up to um, page proportions, um, and then used that as the basis to do my more finished drawing on. So the next level we see is one of these thumbnail drawings. Let me see if I can turn the opacity up on this at all. Um, layouts. Yes, you can see, again, it's drawn very roughly, very gesturally, really only going for the big shapes using the blue pencil. Um, and this helps me to see exactly how the, the main important shapes on the place are going to on the page are going to fit together and make sure that I've got room for anything. As you can see here, when I'm drawing a face, really it's just two lines just to give the direction that, that the head is looking in. So having done that, I would then do more accurate pencils. It seems to me that I've, um, I've turned them to blue. Um, I'll zoom in a little bit so you can get a slightly better look at those. Um, yeah, so this is kind of what the pencils look like. I've used the the straight line tool to draw the straight lines of these uh, these these objects falling through space. Um, I've I've left space for the for the word balloons. That's one of the most important things when designing a page is to make sure that you have left room for all the all the words that have to go on there because without those. It's not going to make much sense. Um, then, then what I do is just very roughly using the brush tool on another layer. I just drop in where I want the areas of solid black to be. And when you're drawing something which is only going to appear in black and white, as this particular job was, um, it's important that the, the, the black areas really clarify the composition and really draw your attention to the things you're supposed to be looking at. I do this really very, very quickly because it is only a guide. And one thing that you want to avoid is drawing something too many times. If you draw it too many times, you're going to get very, very bored with it. So I've got my clean pencils. And then what I need to do is to, is to ink it in. So this is the whole thing uh, inked in. Um, Again, using exactly the tools that I've shown you. I'll zoom in a little so you can see what it looks like. Um, one, of the, one of the pitfalls when you're drawing digitally is that you have got the ability to zoom in very close. And it's very easy to waste time drawing details that are never going to be seen in the finished product. Um, you know, the finished product here was going to appear about the size of a sheet of typing paper. But as you can see, I can zoom in to a degree that, that makes it as big as a door. Um, and the problem is that you can fool around adding little details that look great when you look at them at this size. But when you reduce them down to the printed size, are hardly going to be visible. So one thing you can do is to actually keep two windows open, have one window that's displaying the artwork at print size, and the other window that you're working in and you then can zoom in and out, but you can instantly see 
whether what you're drawing is making any difference to the final printed piece. And it's the final printed piece, which of course is the most important thing. Um, then the final thing to do with the page of comics is to add the letter. Uh, there are some very good lettering tools in, in Clip Studio. These aren't quite finished. These need to have the, the tails added on them. But as you can clearly see, um, I've, I've left room for these balloons. When they go in, they don't cover up any essential parts of the drawing. Um, and they're at a size that's legible. Um, and um, they, they, they are actually based um, it's a digital font, but it's based on scans of my own hand lettering. So it looks, again, exactly as if um, I had done it tr traditionally, having to rule out lines to, to space the letters on and, and gone through monkey work. Um, it's great just to be able to type the lettering in or cut and paste it from the script. OK, so that was um, 2000 AD page. Next, I'm going to show you um, a color piece. Um, this is Dan Dare, who is a very, very famous British comic book character. Um, he's been around in, in England for maybe the past 70 years almost. Um, I used to read him when I was a kid. And later on, I got the chance to draw his adventures in uh, 2000 AD. And this was a cover for a collection of the Dan Dare stories that I'd been lucky enough to draw. So... Again, I'll go back to the very beginning of this. I'll get rid of everything, and then we'll come back in from the very first stages right up to the finish. Well, the first thing I did was to do um, a color rough. Um, and this, again, I started off fairly small. Um, and as you can see, it's, it's, it's quite crude. There's no attempt to really model anything in a lifelike way. It's just to get the big areas of color in and to see how the whole thing might work together. And that, again, using Clip Studio and its wonderful painting tools, you can do very, very quickly. Um, one thing I should say about Clip Studio is it, that it does a certain thing when you're coloring, which is invaluable. Um, you actually start any color piece by putting flat colors in, not fully modulated colors. and um, you can later use those areas of flat color to select areas to do more extensive rendering on. And what Clip Studio does is allow you to use a black line layer as a reference layer to do the painting on a layer underneath it. And that means that you can expand the color to go right underneath the lines. Uh, and I find this in invaluable. It saves a whole lot, lot of steps compared to trying to do it in something like Photoshop or Painter. I, again, there are so many things that you can do with Clip Studio that I really haven't got the time to go into in depth. I mean, the whole area of colour, you know, is an hour webinar in, in its own right. But this is pretty well documented in the, in the software. And again, if you look online, there are many, many colourists nowadays who use Clip Studio and you'll find that this you can color in a very streamlined way using it. So that was the color rough. This is what I've called the, the, the layout, which I essentially traced off the rough. I'll, I'll bring the, try and bring the color rough up again, if I can. Um, you can see it quite closely follows the color rough. I've, I've moved, moved a few items around to clarify things. Um, on top of the layout layer, oh, on top of the layout layer, we've got the pencils layer, which again I've done in blue here. This is very, very close to the um, to the layout layer beneath it. Although again, you can see here, I've changed the changed the size of some of the elements, moved them around to read better. Uh, you, you're always discovering as you go along and drawing that. You have to modify things and change things. And in fact, the whole act of drawing is a kind of a juggling act. It's one of, of adjustment and working to and fro um, until you finally commit yourself with an ink line. So always be quite happy to move things around, erase things, improve them. The, the pencils are really the stage where you should get the drawing right so that when you come to do the inks, you can ink with confidence, knowing that everything's in the right place, everything's going to work, and you really only have to worry about making 
clean, accurate uh, pen lines. So th this is what the, the inks look like. In this case, I've inked the various elements on a different layer. So this is the front layer, the top layer, which is Dan Dare himself. And beneath that, I've inked in the background. And somewhere here where it says full inks, I've inked in the spaceship as well. So you get quite a good idea there of how the various, the various parts fall into place. So let's bring up the full inks and get rid of the, the pencils. So here, here we have a clean, uh, not too shabby. I can see things in it I'd like to change, but a not too shabby ink drawing, which has got all the elements on it. From there, I would move to the flat color layer, which is what I was just talking about. And if you remove the, um, if you remove the ink line, you can see that the colors don't go up to the edge of the ink line. They actually go under the ink line. And this is very important because when it's printed, you don't want any white areas showing through, any missing areas to show through in the color. And if you have it going under the black line, the black line will always cover any minor inaccuracies in the printing process. So here we have a thing that's really quite close to the, the, the finished item. Colors are all worked out, the, the local colors of everything, not the colors as they will appear once they're lit and rendered. So then we have a layer, and I like to do it on a separate layer, which is called rendering, which is using the flat color areas basically as a way to select areas to render, if that's clear. Use the magic wand tool to select the flat areas and then color them on the rendering layer. So this is the fully rendered color. Um, it's got gradients in it. Um, I've used some star uh, pen tools in it to get that nice random starry kind of look. Um, and I've tried to harmonize the cover so everything sits out nicely. And that again is a, is a rough logo just to give a feeling of how it's going to work with the logo on there. And the final layer here you may or may not be able to see is the template layer, which shows the final trim area for the artwork. On color work, I always try and leave quite a lot of bleed off the page so that if they decide to move the image around for a logo or an imprint to fit better, uh, you're still going to be completely covered over the whole area with the fully rendered color. I, I hope that's clear. As I say, lots of stuff to get through. Right, let's move on to the next one, which is another um, another black and white comic page. This is from an anniversary issue of Doctor Who. I drew Doctor Who for many years in the, wow, what, the, the late 70s, early 80s. I drew Tom Baker. He was my doctor. Um, but now um, they've had several changes. Uh, and the latest one with Jodie Whittaker, I really love it. It's, it's, it's about time we had a lady doctor. Um, but this was actually drawn at the time when uh, Peter Capaldi was the doctor. Um, and I got to draw three pages with Peter Capaldi in it, meeting up with this character called, um, I think his name is Thomas Edison, who, um, uh, oh no, Maxwell Edison, who's this kind of UFO expert who the doctor has run into before. And they meet again on this country lane in the middle of the night. So that's what the finished piece looked like. Again, I'll show you from the beginning how it builds up. Okay. So again, the first thing is a rough layout. And as you can see, this is an extremely rough layout. Um, you can probably see what it's what's supposed to be going on because you've seen the finished piece. But if it wasn't for that, this would probably only make sense to me. So those are the very rough layouts. These are the more detailed layouts that, that I drew on top. Again, just feeling out the major forms of the figures, how the composition is going to, going to work, not going into too much detail, uh, changing things, erasing them, mo moving them around, rotating them. Um, again, I did the same thing of dropping in some heavy blacks just to give me a guide to the final inking as to what I wanted to be solid black and what to leave more more open. Um, now, a wonderful thing you can do in Clip Studio is to actually use three-dimensional models. You can import um, um, models from other software packages, 3D modeling packages, and you can actually manipulate them in 
Clip Studio, and you can render them in outline form, which means you can then use them as an underdrawing to do your own drawing on top of. So here we've got one called Moped Refs, um, and um, I'll just knock that back a bit. And as you can see, I've, I've used the positions that I've drawn in my layout to drop in these 3D model renderings of a motorbike, of a moped, in fact. Um, now, these aren't perfect, and they're nothing like good enough to be used for the final art themselves, but they give you a really, really good guide. And although I could construct a motorbike from my imagination, it saves me the hassle and the time of doing that. Um, so that's what they look like. Again, when you're doing likeness work, when you're having to draw characters who look like real world characters, in this case, Peter Capaldi, you really do need to use photographic reference. Never be ashamed of using photographic reference. It's the only way you can make things look real. But always set, always fit the reference to your imagination, not the other way around. So you can see that what I've done is I've taken uh, or used photos of Peter Capaldi and his sonic screwdriver, but I've, I've decided where they're going to be in my rough at the beginning and then slotted these in. Again, when I was drawing Tom Baker, I did it in a very similar way, except I'd have to use a projector to project drawings and photos of Tom, Tom Baker down onto the artwork. This one makes it a lot easier. You can also, if you're really feeling lazy, you can actually use yourself as, as a reference. And this is a picture of me that I took with the webcam on, on my computer just so I could drop in um, a quick idea of a running figure. So. Having done all that, let me get rid of these references because they make things a little less clear. Um, I ended up with this, which is pretty much a finished pencil drawing. I haven't had to drop all the you know, draw all the blacks in in pencil because I know where they're going to be, and I obviously haven't figured out where I'm going to draw the TARDIS just yet. It, it goes around here. So those are the pencils. Those are the, as it were, the pencil dark areas added on another layer at the same kind of darkness as the pencil lines, so they don't swamp them. So that's the finished pencil drawing. And then over the top of that are the finished inks. Um, so you can you can look at how it's progressed from the um, from the original rough layout, which is this, to the final drawn thing. All, all the time you're you're adding to the drawing, you're refining the drawing, you're finding new challenges, you're using all the capabilities of the software, including some foliage brushes, which you can see around all these trees in the background, which meant they were really quite quick to draw. You then drop your frame in, and again, Clip Studio will draw all the frames with perfectly um, even gutters and nice sharp corners and r right angles without you having to um, do that using drafting equipment. And finally, again, you drop the letters in on top. And as you can see from the very beginning, I've left room for the letters so they don't obscure the artwork. OK, I, now I'm going to come to what is the final um, example. Um, this is a character called, uh, well, he's not actually called Dr. Grodbort, but he comes from uh, a creation called Dr. Grodbort which is um, some software that you can get uh, on the Magic Leap platform. I, some of you may have heard of Magic Leap. It's an absolutely amazing, groundbreaking um, um, mixed reality software, which means you wear goggles, but unlike Oculus, they're not completely enveloping uh, goggles. They enable you to continue seeing the real world and to place uh, virtual objects in the real world and interact with them. And Dr. Grodbort is, a, is an idea that's been developed by the people down at Weta in New Zealand. And it's basically a shoot 'em up robot story where robots appear out of the walls of your home and jump all over your furniture and you try and destroy them before they destroy you. Um, there's going to be a series of comic books which are also going to chronicle um, the adventures of Dr. Grodbort. Um, and as I'm a friend of Magic Leap, much as I'm a friend of Clip Studio, um, um, in fact, I'm a creative consultant for them. Uh, they thought they put that creativity to use and asked me to draw um, a cover for one of the comic books. 
Again, this is a similar procedure. You may even be quite familiar with my, my working process by now. But again, it starts off with a rough. And this is a very rough rough of this robot character. Again, I've just drawn the main shapes in. I haven't attempted to get any perfect circles or any perfectly straight lines. I just wanted to, to be sure that it would fit nicely on the cover, have the right kind of presence, and that I'd be able to fit details like the rocket and the, the rings of the planet in. So having done that, I then in this case did a tonal rough where I got a black line version of, of that blue rough and I added greys to it. Quite, quite often, the success of a full colour uh, illustration is to do with the values that you use rather than the colours themselves. So it's if it works as a black and white composition, as long as you don't lose those tonal values, it's going to work as a colour composition. So um, that's the tonal rough. Um, so the first thing I did was to draw the draw the inks. And this is these are the partial inks uh, because um, I decided to take some of the lines into color rather than have them as black lines. I just wanted to change them into color. And as I showed you earlier, that's a really easy thing to do with Clip Studio. You merely just change the expression color of the, of, of the layer and the color changes. So this is my nice clean drawing of the robot using circle guides and ellipse guides to make sure that everything is, is accurate. Um, and then the first next thing I did was to do the, the flat layer, which, as you can see, is a bit simpler than on the Dandare artwork. Uh, and again, this is going to allow me to select the various areas and to um, render them um, cleanly without bleeding off into layers that I areas that I don't want to render. So this is it with the rendering on it. As you can see, the general effect is the same, but it's got a lot more subtlety and I've adjusted uh, the the, the, the colors to make the background fall more into the background and to put the rocket there um, in space and, and to give everything depth. And then the final thing I had to do with it was to add some very subtle glow around the robot's eyes and the, the light on his chest. And I did that as a final little kind of cherry on top. So there we are. I've had to go through these examples fairly quickly, but I hope it's given you an idea of the range of things that you can do with Clip Studio and also my method of working. It's not to say this is the only way to work. And one of the wonderful things um, about the Internet is you can see people using exactly the same tools and producing wildly different results. So I, I'm always thrilled to see what other artists produce. And I'm, I'm always ready to learn. And I, I have learned many things, as I hope some of you are going to learn tonight. Now, I understand we, we're going to have time for some questions and answers. So I don't know if I pass it back to Fahim, whether he wants to get that process going. We'll let Joanna jump in and we'll continue sharing your screen, uh, Dave. So uh, Joanna, I'm sure will join us in a okay. few seconds here. Yes, hello. Okay. Um, we have a ton of questions, so let's get through them through as many as we can. Um, so mm -hmm. one of the, the most asked questions is, what kind of brushes do you use? Are they available for download? And do you make your own? Right. Um, well, I, I use a, a wide variety of, 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 of brushes. I, I mean, there are, there are several really good ones actually included with the software. And it's very easy to modify them. Uh, you, you can go to subtool detail and you can change everything about them really in fact more are possible that I actually understand so I'll quite often um, use um, brushes that are commercially available there's a guy called Ray Frendon who does incredible artwork himself and he's made his own brushes that he's put for sale uh, and uh, several of the brushes I use um, are based on his pencil, um, ink, and painting tools. Uh, there's, there's, there's also a set of brushes from Dorp. I can't think of the guy's real name, and my apologies for that to the guy, but if you search Dorp, you'll find that you can see here I'm scrolling through a huge, a huge amount of particularly painting brushes. Um, 
so that's what I tend to do. But but as I say, I sort of look for brushes that emulate the real world tools that I use. And I would have to say what's what's actually happened is that as it's become more and more expensive to manufacture the real world brushes and pens, their quality has dropped. And in fact, you can get a much better quality of line, a much more accurate quality of line using software these days than you can using the using the real things which is a shame in one way but in, you know is, is a really good substitute okay um then there were a lot of questions about your equipment and your setup what tablet are you using and what well you're obviously using a mac but apart from that what's your setup yeah um i've got i've got a, a rather old mac it's been serving me very very well it's it's a mac pro and i've had it since about 19 no 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 not 19 um 2010 or so and i've upgraded the ram and put put different drives in it and everything um and i'm not running the latest uh, the, the the latest mac software in fact I, I, it's the it's the one before last whichever mountain range that, that that's named after I'm, I'm using, uh, I was going to say the latest version of, of Clip Studio, but I believe a new version was actually released today. And I haven't had time to get that installed before this webinar, but, you know, they do imp improve the features with every new iteration. So I always try and make sure that I'm on the latest version of um, um, Clip Studio Pro. Uh, I rather Clip Studio EX is the version that, that, that I use. Um, I, I have got a Wacom Cintiq. It's a Wacom Cintiq 27 HD. I decided not to go for the touch sensitive one. And I find that the, the 27 is a really good size. Um, I probably will, if I'm lucky, upgrade to one of the new 24 or maybe even 32 Cintiqs. Um, and I know there are cheaper versions um, available. I've, I've always been very well served by Wacom. Again, they are very robust. And as I said about Clip Studio, one of the most important things is to have robust equipment and, and software. You don't want to spend your time fixing technical issues and recovering from crashes. So yeah, those are the um, materials I, I use. Um, I, I also do some of my roughs uh, on, on an iPad Pro which I find is a, is a really nice thing to draw on, uh, really, really close to um, a real world drawing experience. Um, and again, the, the Apple Pencil works absolutely beautifully on there. And I'll sometimes start off doing roughs on that and sometimes more finish work. Um, but I think because I've been used to working at, at a drawing table for all these years um, a large whack on actually feels closer to a drawing table and makes me feel more more relaxed and uh, um, cozy okay thank you very much um now we have a few technical questions about the mm -hmm. way you produce your comics um what page format do you use for your comic books and what resolution okay um well i've got let me just have a look. You can still see my screen. Um, as you can see, you can create any kind of comic book size page you want using Clip Studio. And I've got them. I've got the pages here for the Doctor Who story, the 2000 AD story. Um, and you'll find if you go online that you can find the exact dimensions for the pages that all the publishers use. And it's relatively simple using these controls on this palette to actually replicate those, to set all the measurements, the trim areas, which is the bit you cut off after the comic's been printed, the, um, the what they call the safe area, the area within which word balloons have to be. It's very easy to set those up at the very beginning and save them as presets. Um, so you should, if you want to draw for a particular publisher, look for what their specifications are. Um, you can then, um, in the uh, panel divider tool, um, you can have the gutters between the pictures be exactly what, what, what you want them to be and the thickness of the panel rules. Again, I'm having to go over that quite quickly 
because uh, there is a lot of detail to be talked about there. But that's basically how I go about getting to the finished page. Nowadays, because computers are much faster and have much more RAM on them, I, I actually normally work at 600 dots per inch. Um, in, 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 in the old days, it would have slowed your computer down way too much. But most computers nowadays can quite happily handle comic book size pages at 600 dpi i think what i should point out as well is that the size you have set for the page is the actual printed size um you know in the traditional way of doing comics you would draw on bristol board drawing board that was half as big again obviously on the computer where you can zoom in and out you know you can look at it any size you like but you have to have the finished size the size of the comic that's going to be printed um so that is kind of how i go about that hope that answers that question yes thank thank you very much um how do you do the lettering type in clip studio paint do you draw it or do you use a font um i do actually use use a font um and and as i say i i had some friends of mine actually make um, a computer font from my hand lettering. They scanned lots and lots of pages of my artwork and a couple of alphabets that I lettered, um, is, is especially for them, and um, made it so that it's, I think it's a true type file and you can drop it into Clip Studio or Photoshop or Illustrator or whatever you prefer to do your lettering in. Um, and um, it, it's, I, May as well say it because they're good friends of mine. It's a company called Comicraft, and you can actually buy my hand lettering font from Comicraft and a lot of other people's uh, hand lettering fonts as well. And it's it's a really strange experience to open a comic, as I occasionally do, and find out that it looks as if I've done all the hand lettering in it, whereas I actually haven't. Um, and there was one one particular month where it looked as if I'd hand lettered about eight dif different comics. Um, but the, the main reason for, for having a font is um, uh, to be able to do your own lettering with it. Um, and I find it's a tremendous time saver. And again, in Clip Studio, you can do the balloons, you can do the tails, uh, you can do any style of lettering you like. Um, sometimes if it's for a particular reason, if I want the lettering to look a little bit different, I might actually use my font and then draw over the top of it because obviously being able to type the font does a lot of the technical things but by drawing it by hand you can add a bit more oomph to it but i would only do that in rare occasions usually i'm very happy with the way the font comes out um, when you type it in okay um how often do you use reference in your work um well i use reference quite a lot um as i say i don't r rely on it and i don't look for the reference before I do the drawing. I'll tend to draw from my imagination. And then when I reach the limit of my imagination, like does it does it have a fender at the front? How many lights has it got? You know, it would only be at that point that I'd look for reference. And then I might either just look at the reference, have it beside my drawing board, or um as you can do in clip studio uh, you can you can actually have a um, a thing called sub view which is which is a whole a whole window that you can drop reference into so you can have it open next to your artwork and, and just skim through it and look for the actual bit of reference you 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 want the real trick of using reference is to make it look like you haven't used reference in other words not blindly follow the lighting on it or not blindly follow um, you, you know, some obscure detail of it. And also to know enough about drawing that you can correct for distortion or you can distort it in a, in a way that you want. But I must say that in the really early early days when I was drawing comics for the USA, um, I only had two reference books in New York City. So every time I had to draw New York City, I would, I would try and find a photo that I hadn't used before. Now, of course, you can go on the internet and using... Google Earth or Google Street View, you can walk down any street in New York you want and see exactly what it looks like. Um, and then finally, as I mentioned, there's that you can use three, 3D models. You can also use software like Poser or, um, or um, is it Daz Studio? And you can actually use human figures 
to get color lighting on them and use them as re reference palettes for doing your coloring with. Uh, and again, within Clip Studio, there are actually kind of anatomically correct figures in there that you can pose and use as a, as a kind of framework to do your own figure drawing on. Okay, thank you. Um, how long does it usually take you to finish a page? <laughs> Too long. Um, it, it, it takes me much longer now than it used to. Um, when, when I was young and fearless, as I hope many of you are, I would work very, very quickly. Um, in my heyday, I was maybe drawing uh, five pages a week. This would be for British comics, maybe five pages with seven or eight pictures on each page. Um, and it would be drawn and lettered and have tone put on it as well. And by the way, you've got infinite uh, tone that you can use in Clip Studio. Um, I used to have to buy the sticky sheets and cut the areas out with a scalpel. That's that's a thing of the past now. But yeah, on a really fast week, I would draw maybe five pages. Um, you know, if I could draw a page a day, I'd be really, really happy. Something like this cover that I've got up here now, that probably would have taken me maybe a couple of days to do um it's 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 hard to say certainly everything i do goes much more quickly for being drawn digitally um and i never run run, run out of paint and i never drop my favorite pen on the floor and spoil it so um yeah that's that's an idea about that did you find it difficult did to transition difficult? from digital to traditional to digital inking um, not really. Um, I think, I think um, sometimes it's the, the texture of the drawing tablet can be a deciding factor or the exact nib that you use in your digital pen. Sometimes if you've got a slightly softer nib, you get more control over the ink line. And I did play around a lot to begin with using screen protectors and different kinds of nibs in the, the Wacom pen until I found the combination that I really liked. But again, once you've you've done it a few times, you get used to the feeling and it starts to feel comfortable. Um, a good friend of mine, when I was bemoaning to him one day, oh, it's so difficult to learn this new software and everything. He said, yeah, but just think about how long it's taken you to learn how to use real world material properly. How long you practice with a brush to be able to draw, draw with a brush or to get just the pencil line that, that you want. And really compared to that digital, you know, is, an, is actually a shorter learning curve. But there is no substitute for, for practicing. You can read about it as much as you like. You can watch YouTube as much as you like. You can listen to people me talk as much as you like me talk as much as you like. But the real way to get good at digital drawing and painting is to actually get in there and draw and paint. Okay. Um, so we have a, a question for you personally. If you could start all over, would you still become a comic artist? Um, yes, I, yes, I would. I mean, w when I was a kid and decided this was what I wanted to do, it was the most unlikely thing to do. You know, I, I live in the middle of nowhere in England and I wanted to draw American comic books. And, you know, my parents and school teachers tried to tell me, no, it's, no, no, you know, it's, it's a nice hobby, but you'll never be able to do it for a living. And I, I did have to push quite hard. I had to persevere um uh, to to actually get to the point where magically i was drawing um, american comic books and really at that point the only thing i would really have wanted to do was to be able to sit in a room and draw you know wonderful stories um the fact that it would lead on to things like me um you know going to comic conventions or people making movies out of things that, that i've worked on or even the fact that i would sit here in the middle of nowhere in England on a computer speaking to people um, all over the world about drawing with computers. I mean, that seems absolutely impossible. So, you know, the way it's worked out for me, I, I, I mean, I've worked hard, but I've been very lucky as well. Uh, and I've had a very nice time doing comics. And yeah, if I had the chance again, I absolutely would do it. Okay, so we have one last question for, um, today because we're running out of time here. Um, there were so okay. many more, so I apologize for everyone who couldn't 
for everyone's question we couldn't answer, but um, what is your advice for people who are just starting out in digital drawing or making comics? Okay, well, uh, if you're going to do it as as a hobby or a, a part-time job, um, that's great, and that's probably the best way to start out. I mean, it's also very good to learn as much as you can. I mean, I didn't ever go to art school. That wasn't a possibility. But if you get the chance to learn more about art, then learn as much as you can um, and look at all sorts of different art, not just comic book art or not just fantasy art look at the whole world of art because you'll always learn something um, life drawing is really really important after not doing it for a long long time I've started doing that again recently and that's a, it's a really enjoyable thing to do and you find out so much um, and you kind of re replenish your bank of images that you carry around in your head. You get to draw so many figures doing so many different things that you can find it much easier just to conjure figures up from your, your imagination. Um, if you want to draw for a living, if you want to do comics or animation or something for a living, you have to really, really like to draw because you're going to be spending eight hours a day, five or six days a week, may, maybe more drawing. So you have to really enjoy doing it and you have to persevere um, but I think that really is the answer to it. You just have, you learn to draw by drawing. Some, somebody once said, get your first 10,000 bad drawings over with as quickly as you can. And I think that's right. And I certainly look at things that I did, even the early things I did when I was working professionally. And I think, wow, I really didn't know what I was doing back then, but somehow miraculously after years of drawing it, I've, kind of found out a bit of what I think I'm doing. Um, so I think that would be my advice to draw, draw and draw and also enjoy it. You know, you can always tell with the drawing whether it's been enjoyed or whether it's been labored over. So try and keep free, try and keep loose, build things up. Don't try and get a completely finished professional quality drawing at the, at the first opportunity. And you, if you persevere and you keep drawing, you will get better and better. And if your ambition is to draw for a living, hopefully one day you'll have all the skills and the temperament to be able to do it. Okay, thank you very much. That should be it for the questions today. Okay. All right, thank you so much, everybody. Um, Dave, once again, thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate you um, taking um, an hour to go through your workflow with Clip Studio Paint. Uh, it was an extremely informative webinar. I'm sure everyone in the audience learned a lot. Um, and I wanted to thank those folks that attended the webinar as well for um, you know, spending one hour with us. Um, as well, uh, for folks that want to learn more about Clip Studio Paint, please go to graphicsly.com or clipstudio dot net forward slash en and as well please follow dave on twitter so dave's uh, sign or or hashtag or at sign is dave gibbons 90 on twitter and i'm sure he'll appreciate the uh, the new followers and with that dave thank you so much for your time you're very welcome i've really enjoyed it and thanks everybody for taking part in the uh, webinar and keep drawing thank you have a great day bye bye